A little more than a week ago, the New Yorker's Ryan Lizza got a late-night phone call that turned out to have fateful consequences. Who, who leaked that to you? Oh, man, I can't tell you that. Uh, what's that? What I can't tell you that. But Okay, so I'm just going to, what I'm going to do is I'll, I will eliminate everybody in the comms team and we'll start over. <laughs> so, so it's no problem. That's all. So I asked these guys not to leak anything and they can't help themselves, so we'll eliminate everybody. So was somebody, somebody in the comms team leaked that to you? I can't tell That's you Anthony that. Scaramucci just days into his appointment as communications director. He wanted to know who had given Liz a certain piece of information, very minor information about dinner at the White House and who was there. But the leaking thing had him really angry. Okay, but you're an American citizen. This is a major catastrophe for the American country. So, so I'm asking you as an American patriot to give me a sense for a leak. <laughs> well, I, the only thing I can tell you is two, is two people in the White House who I know wouldn't lie to me. You know what I mean? <laughs> Come on, I can't tell you, buddy. You know I can't do that. You know, so, you go. You, you can give me. Is it? A, is an assistant to the? If you told is it an assistant to the? Is it assistant to the president? In the course of the conversation, he savaged his rivals in the White House. He accused Reince Priebus of being a leaker, and Priebus was fired within two days. Some of what Scaramucci said to Ryan Lissa was stunning, even by the standards of the Trump administration. And Ryan is a paranoid schizophrenic, paranoiac. And what he's going to do is, oh, maybe Bill Shine's coming or something. Let me leak thing and see if I can block these people the way I block Scaramucci for six months. Okay, but, but he leaked the CFIA stuff on me. Uh, you know, my financial disclosure has been leaked to Politico, yeah, so. which, is a fi- which, yeah, which is a felony. Ryan wrote a story for NewYorker.com that included some words that we can't say on the air. But I wanted to ask you if you wanted to be profiled. I don't. I don't want to be profiled. Well, just I'm what not you're Steve trying Bannon. to do. What you're trying to do. I'm not. I'm not Steve Bannon. No. I'm not trying to suck my own. <laughs> I'm not trying to build my own brand off and shrink the president. Yeah, but don't I'm you here to serve the country. Good, don't. Don't. At first, the reaction from the White House was more or less nothing, or seemed to be. But then Scaramucci was fired as communications director after a term that lasted a total of 10 days. Okay, the mooch showed up a week ago. This is going to get cleaned up very shortly, okay, because I nailed these guys. I got digital fingerprints on everything that they've done through the FBI and the Department of Justice. What's so the worst thing? It's no, oh, well, the felony, they're going to get prosecuted probably for the felony. They'll probably get prosecuted for that. Okay. Yeah. Wow. They lie detector stars. Yeah. I'm speaking now with Ryan Lizza. And Ryan, I have to ask you, now that you look back on this affair, who was Anthony Scaramucci? And why is he here? What is it about Trump that he reflects? Why does Trump have such obvious affection for him? I think that he convinced Trump and Trump and him both believed that the real problem at the White House, as so many um, politicians believe when they're failing, they believe that the real problem is just a communication strategy, that if only the American public heard or, and saw what the most loyal supporters saw in the president, that everything would be solved. And he convinced Trump that the leadership in the White House, that their view was you had to contain Trump, you had to treat him like a child, essentially, and that Scaramucci playing to Trump's love of being flattered so that, you know, let Trump be Trump is the cliche, right? That was Scaramucci's communication strategy. And I think that that's how he helped convince the president that he should take over the communications shop even though he had no experience doing this. I mean, usually the communications director at a White House is a kind of staff guy, you know? Think of, you know, Dan Pfeiffer or uh, Stephanopoulos back in the day of the Clinton administration. You know, Trump being Trump thinks that political professionals are actually idiots and that he needs to do things his own way. And so I think he was looking for a shortcut to fixing all the problems that the White House had, and Scaramucci was was telling him he could do it. Ryan, let's talk about the call itself. You've been in Washington for quite a long time, writing for quite a long time. Have you ever had a call from a senior White House official trying to squeeze you for sources? No, it was so unusual, David. I mean, I've said this now, you know, in 20 years of doing this, I've never had a phone conversation like that. I mean, 
I got off the phone and just sort of stood there silently in my, I was in my bedroom. <laughs> I just sort of stood there. It was, you know, this was 1030 at night. And I just stood there shaking my head saying that is the most unusual conversation I have ever had with a senior government official. I downloaded the audio clip off my little uh, recorder and I, I, I gave it the name on my computer. I called it Insane Scaramucci Interview. And then I started to think hard about, you know, what's the news value here? Were there any uh, ground rules? Um, you know, when you have the White House communications director a conversation like that, you set some ground rules, but there were no ground rules set. And, you know, off the record and background are bargains between a source and a journalist. There has to be an offer of, okay, hey, I want to talk to you off the record. Is that acceptable? And the journalist has to agree to that. That that didn't happen. As I told him, frankly, the next day when I called him to tell him we were publishing this, I told him, you know, you speak for the most powerful institution in the world. A conversation like that is presumptively on the record. And what you said was extremely newsworthy. And he didn't push back. He knew he had, knew he had made a mistake. Or at least it seemed he had made a mistake. And yet we hear from the White House, at least from anonymous sources, that at first the president of the United States thought this was fine. In fact, he was speaking, Scaramucci was, in his master's voice, no? Yeah, those were the first indications. But, you know, sometimes with this White House, when people are anonymously channeling what Trump believes, you know, you have to be so careful with some of that reporting because often it is, you know, agenda-driven, right? But clearly something changed once Reince was gone and once Kelly, John Kelly, the new chief of staff, was in. And perhaps it was as simple as John Kelly being a, a military guy and a bit more of a grown-up compared to some of the people in this White House telling Donald Trump, this is an intolerable situation. I can't have a communications director who, one, doesn't even report to me and who, two, um, would call up a reporter at 1030 at night and go off on a, on a rant like this. What does the call tell us about what's going on inside the White House. It seems to me, at least, that everybody hates everybody. Everybody's leaking on everybody. <laughs> <laughs> There's no sense yeah, was... of, of cohesion or continuity. And every day, every day ends with at least one bombshell that is, is just jaw-dropping. Yeah, and you already had three or four factions fighting with each other in the White House. And by dropping Scaramucci in, Trump created a whole new faction with its own new leader. Um, so just from a management perspective, I mean, I, I know Trump thinks playing people off of each other can be a successful management strategy, but it shows that Trump still has this ad hoc management strategy um, where he makes decisions without necessarily thinking through all the consequences. Are you um, just being polite bad... there? It, it, that sounds like a polite <laughs> interpretation. <laughs> He's a bad manager. And White House management, I mean, there's a lot that's been written about this. It's no mystery. And the first thing everyone knows is you have a strong chief of staff and everyone reports to the president through the chief of staff. And you have clear lines, clear lines of authority. Trump never adopted that system. Instead, he set up competing power centers, his son-in-law and his daughter in one power center, Steve Bannon in another power center, Reince Priebus in a third. Those are the three main ones. And as someone once told me, the key to getting any decision made in the White House was you had to have two against one. So you had to win Reince and Bannon against Kushner, and you could win a debate, or sometimes Bannon and Kushner would team up against Reince, and then you could win something. During campaigns, a lot of our readers and the public feels that the press is too obsessed with the horse race. During times mm -hmm. of governance, we're too obsessed with just this, palace intrigue. But why yes. is this palace intrigue important when it comes to everything from health care to Russia and onward? If you do not have a well-run, normal, functioning White House... How do you solve any of the multiple crises that are going on around the world? Everything flows from having a structure that is coherent and can get uh, decisions to the president that he can make with a process where all the different policy advisors weigh in. So having a sane, normal White House uh, is key to dealing with any of the other crises. So I was talking to some national security officials recently and doing some other reporting, and... 
everyone is on pins and needles waiting for some international crisis, God forbid a terrorist attack, something bad happening on the Korean peninsula. And then all of this palace intrigue and soap opera thing is, is not going to seem so funny anymore because we're going to have a dysfunctional White House that has to grapple with that. So now we have another general in charge, this time General Kelly as chief of staff. Great faith has been put on generals in the Pentagon, yeah. national security. Generals are ascendant. What are the odds that General Kelly can bring some cohesion and continuity and sanity to the White House? That's one thing. And secondly, what does it mean that generals are in charge with such a president? I do think that in a normal presidency, there would be a lot more concern about generals being, one, being in charge of the Pentagon. But with Trump, and, and because uh, folks both in the Senate and uh, other people who think about this stuff were so worried about the quality of the people that would go work for him, I think a lot of people were relieved that uh, General Mattis would take that job. And so I think that, you know, Trump gets graded on a curve. As for Kelly in the White House, I'll tell you three things that I know about him from other national security officials that have dealt with him. The first is that he has expressed recently disdain for Congress and the press. That's not a good sign. As a general, he didn't have to deal with the press the way that a, a more uh, a politically minded uh, person would. Also, Congress. You know, most most members in the House and Senate, they want the chief of staff to be there for them. They want to be able to call him up and they want him to understand their issues. Kelly is not a, a huge fan of dealing with Congress. So that's something to watch for. On whether he can solve one of the core problems at the White House, just the, the managerial dysfunction, it looks like there are some positive signs. It looks like Trump has made him more of a traditional chief of staff. There, so far, it looks like everyone will report through him. I, you know, I used to say this during the campaign, but there was a lot of soap opera-like coverage of palace intrigue in the Trump campaign. It was really fun to report on because there are such crazy characters. But at the end of the day, staffing didn't matter. What's dysfunctional about Trump world all stems from Donald Trump himself. And it, as long as he continues to be the same person he has been for the last 71 years, um, I don't really expect major changes, even if the White House is perhaps run a little bit more professionally. Trump is Trump, um, and I don't, I don't see that changing. Ryan, thank you so much, and make sure to keep answering your phone late at night. <laughs> Thanks, David. Take care. 